Happy Sunday, everyone. And uh, today we're talking about idolatry. And when I say that we are an idolatrous people, who do I mean by we? I mean you and me and the members of our church. To say nothing of broader Christendom and, you know, people of other faiths and no faiths everywhere. But we like to think that, oh, I'm, I'm not idolatrous. I don't worship golden calves. I'm not polytheistic. I I worship God. I go to church. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm immune from that. No problem. And so we read these examples in the scriptures and don't really relate them to ourselves very well. And it's been interesting for me in recent months as I've been working on a Tuttle Twins history book that we're launching um, in July. I've been really thinking about this quote that I know all of you have heard. We hear it all the time. And yet for all the times we hear it, we, we don't do anything about it. We don't understand it. Right. You could even probably finish the second half of this quote when I say it. Those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it, condemned to repeat it, however you want to say it. We know this quote, right? If we don't learn from the past, then we're going to repeat basically its mistakes. And yet, like if you look at social studies books and how we talk about American history, uh, we do a horrible job because we teach superficial history, facts and dates and battles and names and whatever that in no way relates to a kid's life in 2022. And so rather than teaching the substance of history, the ideas, the values, the concepts, the philosophies, which can be applied to what's going on in our day, history is dumbed down and, and, and you know, we teach kids all this fluff that they are then ill-equipped to avoid the mistakes of the past, which is why I think so many of them support socialism and stupid ideas today. So I think it's the same with the Bible. I think in a lot of respects, we read the Old Testament and we flitter through the different stories of here, the children of Israel did this and then manna fell from heaven and then they complained and then they went here and then this you know, group attacked them here. And, and we do the superficial history because it's easy. It's the path of least resistance, but it is the least productive for our personal and spiritual growth because we're not learning from it. We're not learning the values, the ideas, the concepts that can be applied to our day. So today I taught gospel doctrine and as I was reviewing Come Follow Me, the, you know, bunch of different scriptures, again, it's like walking through all these things, like drive by Old Testament history. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, then over here. And they're having you read all these chapters, which makes sense because you got to get through the Old Testament in a year, which is the model that uh, Come Follow Me follows. And so I'm sitting there thinking like, man, what do I, how do I turn this into a lesson? Well, I can spend the whole hour doing a a kind of, uh, what do you call it? Like a, a travel log, right? The children of Israel went here and then this happened. And, that, and, and that's, I think, what a lot of teachers do. It's the easy thing. It's the, you know, but no one leaves that class feeling spiritually nourished. No one comes away from a class like that and has anything that they can apply to their lives today. And so I think that's our challenge is that we have to, um, we have to talk about history in a way that can be applied to our lives. Now, for those of you who are uh, watching this live, you're going to go on a little walk with me. I got to go let my dog out. So that is what I focused on for the lesson today. As I was reading all these chapters and I was saying, here's my dog. Hi, dog. Go out and go pee. Um, what in all of these examples and all these stories, it, what, where is there something that can be applied to our day? And what stood out to me was Leviticus 19. So, you know, here's the children of Israel and they're wandering. They've, they've, you know, had all the plagues and whatever. And they are, um, Moses is trying to get them to stop, you know, worshiping other gods. And they went through the whole episode of, you know, the golden calf and, 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 you know, all that history. And I was thinking, you know, I think this is something that we are probably pretty awful at in our church is understanding to what extent we are idolatrous. It was really interesting. Uh, also in this lesson, um, they covered Numbers 21, which was the serpent of brass. And you know this story, right? They're all being bit and getting sick. And Moses lifts up the, the serpent on the, on the staff, on the rod, and look to it and live. And so many of them didn't, wouldn't, because it's too easy and too simple. And so they, you know, pass away. And so then later in the New Testament, Jesus is saying, I am going to be lifted up. You have to look to me to live. He is the spiritual equivalent of the kind of carnal, temporal, physical 
story and example that the children of Israel went to. It's this kind of lesser law, higher law. The children of Israel went through this kind of physical thing, created the story, the narrative, and then Christ can refer to it and pull out the spiritual equivalent. So then the question is, as the children of Israel were being idolatrous all over the place, uh, what is the spiritual equivalent today? Right? We're not worshiping golden calves. We're not doing all this, but we are idolatrous. One of the leaders of our church even said, we are on the whole, and I, we, we again, us, right, in the church, we are on the whole an idolatrous people, a condition repugnant to the Lord. I'll get back to this quote a little later. So in class today, I thought the, the easiest model to start would be to walk through the criteria of an idol. What makes an idol an idol? Because it's easy to be like, oh, well, we should be nicer to one another, like all these answers that are not relevant to the core issue of are we idolatrous? And if we are, well, what is an idol? Because if we're going to analyze the idols in our lives today, we have to understand what makes an idol an idol. What are, the, what are its characteristics and qualities so we know what to rule out and what to include and say, yeah, that is an idol. I came across when I was studying yesterday for preparing this, this lesson uh, in class today, I came across this Babylon Bee headline and it said, Look at these dumb Israelites who keep going back to their idols, says man, reading Bible, before going off to worship his own idols. <laughs> and that's the problem, right? It's like we read these and like, ah, oh, those silly Israelites. But again, just like the serpent and uh, the brass serpent uh, and, and Christ having the spiritual equivalent to us, like what are the spiritual equivalents of idols that we struggle with today? It's very fascinating when you read in the scriptures the references to idolatry, what is the language that's being used to talk about it? Idols are referred to as unclean things, as weak and worthless, as insubstantial, vain, empty. And when the, the prophets are and Moses, when they're referring to idols throughout the scriptures, it's not just that the children of Israel to, were supposed to avoid idolatry. It's that they had to utterly abhor it. It couldn't just be like, oh, yeah, it's there, oh, for, you know, but I, I try and avoid it. No, no, no. It, it is an emphatic, like, all or nothing. It must be repugnant to you. You must shun it. It is that level of odiousness. All right. So then with all that being said, what makes an idol an idol? What are the criteria of, of an idol? Now, there's lots of examples in the scriptures that we could point to, and I'm going to keep this list brief because I want to focus in on the kind of core characteristics. And, and in the class, I open it up and we just kind of, you know, shot the breeze and people were given different ideas. Some, I think, less scripturally supported than others, but a lot of good ideas. And what I've been really curious with this weekend and studying this a bit more, and I, I wrote about this in Christ versus Caesar as well. So some of this for me was just refreshing the past kind of deep dive that I had done. When you look at these examples of idolatry, there's some themes that recur over and over again that stand out in my mind as the, I would call them the core characteristics of idols. And the first one that I would point to is um, this idea of protection. So there are several instances, several references in the scriptures to the story of when the children of Israel built the so-called golden calf while Moses was up on Mount Sinai communing with the Lord, getting the, what became the Ten Commandments. And so here's in Acts 7. This is one of the references to um, this story. And, and it says, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church, in the wilderness, with the angel, which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles, etc. All right, here we go. To whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt, saying unto Aaron, make God, make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become. We, we don't know where Moses is. We don't know what he's doing. Hey, Aaron, will you craft some gods that can go before us? So what does it mean for these gods or our God to go before us? When you look at some of the other references, I think two words emerge, two uh, characteristics emerge from that one reference that make us gods to go before us. I think the first is direction. 
right? They, they wanted to know what to do. Their leader was gone. Who do we follow? Hey, make us gods that can tell us what to do. We're following the leader. We're trusting, right? So there's actually a related thing is trust. They, they wanted a, an, an idol, a god to trust. But direction, I think, is the, the kind of primary thing. But the other, the, the secondary, the other characteristic that I would pull out of this when, when it's talking about make us idols, make us gods to go before us, is this concept of protection, safety, security. And there are numerous other examples of this when the children of Israel are abandoning God as their king, their ruler, their protector, and going after other gods to be the source of their protection. In Isaiah 31, later when um, Israel is is uh, seeking aid from Egypt, here in Isaiah it says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots, because they are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is helped shall fall down, and they shall fall together. The Egyptians are mortal. They're, they're, they can't protect you. They're chariots, they're horsemen. You're trusting in them. There's that trust word again, right? But it's this idea of protection. When later Israel was looking to forge military and political alliances with Egypt and with Assyria, the language is all couched in forsaking God, Right. Idolatry is presented in the scriptures as adulterous that, you know, the bride, the bridegroom, we know these uh, kind of analogies or parables. And it's presented that that God's people are committing adultery on God. They are their affection, their loyalty is going somewhere else rather than being committed to God. And so when they're seeking protection elsewhere, they're they're seeking protection away from God. Uh, because they're trusting, they're relying upon something other than God. Okay, so that that is a big one uh, throughout the scriptures. Because the people of Israel, they're they're wandering in the wilderness, they're worried. They, you know, what do we do? Whatever. Like they they want to know who to trust. They they want to be told what to do. They want to be kept safe. I'm sure you're sensing themes that we'll get into of <laughs> our own day. Okay. There's this other concept as well of, of prosperity. Um, different examples throughout the scriptures of how Israel was being idolatrous for almost like a prosperity gospel, right? Of, of ascribing to these idols, the source of their wealth and their desire to have mortal blessings and possessions, right? In Hosea 14 it says, Israel, give up your idols. I will answer your prayers and take care of you. I am that glorious tree, the source of your fruit. I am the reason for your prosperity, for your wealth, for your daily subsistence, for your you know daily bread and whatnot, right? It comes from me, not from these dumb gods, these, these idols. When Christ says in the New Testament, no man can serve two masters, what are the examples that he gives? It's no one can serve both God and mammon which is wealth, riches, you know, prosperity, this economic dependence and, and desire. And so that is another huge idol that the children of Israel had, protection and prosperity. If I were to just simplify the two, there's a lot of interrelated concepts, trust, direction that we've been talking about, right? Uh, but I would say protection and prosperity are kind of broad categories that we might use to uh, to talk about these influences, these characteristics of what makes an idol an idol. Other ones, uh, th this idea in Acts 40, in fact, I didn't read verse 41 to finish Acts 7, that, that reference, right? So they're saying, make us gods to go before us, etc. Verse 41, and they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoice in the work of their own hands. This is another big characteristic that comes up. This idea of, of the work of your own hands. Here's Psalm 115. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. 
They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Over and over and over again, there was this desire to have something tangible, right? Because the intangible, incomprehensible God is hard to relate to. And if, if you're freaked out because you don't know where your next meal's coming from and there's there's assassins roaming the wilderness and bandits and all these things, you're scared. You have these very human tendencies to want, you know, prosperity and protection. That is natural, right? Reasonable, understandable. And so you're looking around and, and God, as you've been taught from Moses, right, is you can't see him, can't relate to him. It, it's this abstract idea maybe very hard so you're a random israelite and, and maybe that's a struggle to quantify the unquantifiable god but instead if you have this calf or i mean they would make these little like figurine things in people's homes and like all kinds of stuff if, if you have something tangible that you can ascribe protection to and trust and direction if, if you have this little idol um, it is much easier for an individual. You can point to something. It's why all these gods and all these polytheistic cultures, there was the sun god, right? And the, and the, uh, the rain god. And they would narrow them down to these things that were more concrete and limited in scope and tangible. They would, they would build physical representations because they could envision better and have more affection and loyalty to something that was quantifiable. In Isaiah 40, it says, To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. He's saying, you have these dumb little gods that are so limited in scope. How can you compare them to me? I am great. I am omniscient, omnipotent, all these things. But I think it's that very characteristic of God that made it hard for the children of Israel to trust him and to rely on him. Because they were, they grew up in this culture that had man-made idols, things that they could quantify and see, and you know, objects of their loyalty. That's why God said, "No graven images, right? Get away from this stuff." But it's that was the temptation for the Israelites was to have something, you know, man-made, the work of our hands, something that we have built, something mortal, something that we can relate to and understand. So. Protection, prosperity, you know, these man-made uh, things, and uh, they're limited in scope. You know, there's other ideas that I'm not going to get into, but there's other characteristics. I would say these are the core, right? So, so in class, I then said, all right, well, we, we went over that. Like, we've got this list of characteristics. What then are our idols? Because, again, if we're going to learn from the past so as not to repeat its mistakes... We can't just, like the Babylon Bee guy, be like, ha, oh, those silly, you know, idolatrous Israelites, and then off we go to have our own idolatry, right? Neil A. Maxwell has that great quote where he talks about not having a summer cottage in Babylon, that so often we, the Latter-day Saints, feel like it's okay to pollute our faith. We don't think we are, but we have a summer cottage in Babylon where periodically we'll go and hang out and, you know, whatever, live in the world, but not of the world, and then we go back and we pretend to be righteous and have a nice single to God's glory. So when I wrote Christ versus Caesar, the whole thing that I was challenging myself to do is to ask this fundamental question. What does an uncontaminated Christianity look like? If, if we look at what Christ is actually saying, what he actually is requiring of us, if we take him at his word if we abandon all the rationalizations and justifications and excuses and interpretations and other things that have come from who knows who and all kinds of people and cultures and all these types of things, then what does an uncontaminated Christianity look like? So in this context, when it comes to idolatry, then the question is, well, what are the idols that are polluting our Christianity? I asked the class this morning or afternoon or whatever it was, I said, do you suppose that the Israelites thought that they were idolatrous? It's an interesting question because here they are worshiping a calf. And yet even then, 
I don't know that they thought that they were idolatrous because what happens, there's this term uh, syncretic religion, basically this, this fusion or combination of different theological ideas and whatever, right? This contamination, uh, you know, look at, I would, as one silly example, I would say like Trumpism and, and evangelical Christianity, where you've got these churches where it's just flags and Trump and all these things and, and they're not worshiping God. They're worshiping this like nationalist, patriotic, like syncretic religion, this contamination of nationalism and, and Christianity combined together. That's syncretic religion. And those people think that they're Christian. They think that they're following Christ. It's just that they've been polluted. So too, I think, with the Israelites, where I think that they had just accommodated some of these other beliefs and practices from the culture that they had grown up in for years and decades. So when, you know, 1 Samuel 8 comes along and the children of Israel are like, give us a king to be like unto all the other nations. Samuel's like, whoa, like bad idea. Hey, you know, don't do that. And God's like, go ahead. They've abandoned me, you know, whatever. Go warn them of what it's going to really be like, be like to have a king. I don't think Israel got there in a day. They, were, they didn't wake up and be like, we want to be like all the nations. It's just that that's their culture. That's what they're familiar with. That was the status quo. Pursuing this uncontaminated uh, gospel was hard. It was difficult. It was awkward. It was antisocial. It was anti-countercultural because the culture is the cult, the cult of Caesar, the cult of Satan, right? That is culture. And so pursuing this uncontaminated gospel is really hard because there's also this concept of we don't know what we don't know. So we've grown up a certain way and we have beliefs and traditions, the traditions of our fathers. And we don't know that they're traditions of our fathers because it's what our fathers taught us and taught us that that's compatible with the gospel, that that is the gospel. So much of what I've talked about here on Sunday Musings is this contrast or this clash between culture and the gospel, where the gospel is being encumbered or contaminated with these different cultural ideas. And we have to uproot them. We have to, we have to know that they even exist in order to uproot them. And so if we don't know what we don't know, then how do we know that our faith is contaminated, that our practices, our belief sets are polluted by the traditions of our fathers? That's tough. That requires, I think, a lot of study and introspection and prayer and diligence because again a recent president of the church prophet as i said earlier and i'll share more in a minute said we are on the whole an idolatrous people we are as guilty maybe more of being idolatrous as the children of israel that's an interesting question are we even more idolatrous than they were for all the repugnance that we have when we read that story and how could you and Moses is up there communing with God and now he comes down and, you know, gives you the lesser priesthood because you're, you know, just down there, you know, having an orgy, which is likely what they were having because there's all this fertility, you know, goddess Asherah stuff. And it says that they were being playful or that they were playing, which is really just biblical euphemism for fooling around and sexual immorality. And that was rampant in those times with this Asherah cult. Um, and so we look at them and we're like, oh my gosh, you're crazy. You know, how could you do this? Children of Israel are so idiotic, right? But are we? Are we worse than them? That, that I think, is a tantalizing question. So we don't know what we don't know. And we have to be so introspective and really look in detail at all of our belief, beliefs and our practices um, in order to understand, are we being impacted by our culture and we don't even know it? Is this really uncontaminated Christianity or have I encumbered it with other things? Because even though they're worshiping a golden calf, even though they have these other idols and these other practices and belief systems and, you know, poles and, and incense and all these things and their groves and all these pagan polytheistic um, ungodly things that, that, that they're being contaminated with again and again and again in the scriptures. Even so, I think that they thought that they were God's people, that what they were doing was acceptable, that 
that's just the way it was. That was their culture. It was accepted. And yet the prophets are over and over again saying, knock this down, cut down the groves, cut down the poles, stop burning the incense, stop sexual immorality, stop all these things that is not our gospel. And yet they thought it was. So what are then the idols of our day? If the characteristics of idolatry are we, we pursue them for protection, for prosperity, they're man-made, Right? If those are kind of the key characteristics of idolatry, what then are our idols? So I opened it up to the class. It's like, let's come up with a list. Someone said talent and celebrity. Someone said work and wealth. Someone said cell phones and technology. Um, what other ideas did we have? People were throwing out various examples. Um, dress, all kinds of things. So then I said, all right, hold up. Let me now read the rest of that quote that I shared only a paragraph or a little snippet of from a leader of the church saying, we are on the whole an idolatrous people, a condition repugnant to the Lord. Now, those of you watching, you know, you're connected to me. You've been maybe following me for a bit or whatever. I'm going to guess some of you know who said that and what the broader quote is. For those who don't, and maybe there's many of you out there, this comes from Spencer W. Kimball. So he says, in spite of our delight in defining ourselves as modern and our tendency to think that we possess a sophistication that no people in the past ever had, in spite of these things, we are on the whole an idolatrous people, a condition repugnant to the Lord. We are a warlike people easily distracted from our assignment of preparing for the coming of the Lord. When enemies rise up, we commit vast resources to the fabrication of gods of stone and steel, ships, planes, missiles, fortifications, and depend on them for protection and deliverance. When threatened, we become anti-enemy instead of pro-kingdom of God. We train a man in the art of war and call him a patriot. Thus, in the manner of Satan's counterfeit of true patriotism, perverting the Savior's teaching where he said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. So, wow, right? <laughs> so I kind of, I read that and I looked around the room. I'm like, oh, how is this being received? You know, and people are like, oh. One guy was like, well, he said that after World War II. <laughs> As if, you know, I, I wasn't going to go there and say, well, World War II only happened because the United States got involved in World War I. And uh, we shouldn't have gotten involved in either. And if you look at the Lord's Law of War in DNC 98, what he calls an ensample to all nations. Basically, this is my law for any war to be justified. Any war, World War II, Revolutionary War, everything else. There are specific criteria that are to be followed that it talks about that Israel were told to do and that that's an ensample, an example, a rule for all nations, all people, all time that, you know, we like to think, well, we were virtuous. We won World War Two. You know, like so that guy, whoever said that in class, I, I just ignored him and moved on. So, yes, Spencer W. Kimball said this in, I think, 1976, but. That in no way, yeah, it was June, I think, 1976. <clears throat> that in no way diminishes the power of what he's saying, right? We, the Latter-day Saints in God's kingdom, we are on the whole an idolatrous people. And so that to me is interesting because if we go back to the characteristics of what makes an idol, protection, certainly, right? That applies something man-made, um, Prosperity, mm, okay, maybe less so for the, the military and, and whatever. But when you abstract it out to Caesar, so this is where I went in Christ versus Caesar in my book, where I talk about this, that Caesar is basically our idol, government. It's man-made. It is the source of our acclaimed, purported source of our protection, of our prosperity, Um it is a, a, a God that we can see, that we can relate to, that we can trust, that we can take direction from. It is the counterfeit. 
It's Caesar. It's, it's government. It's this man-made institution where we are like the children of Israel saying, we want to be like unto all the nations, right? We have no God but Caesar, no king but Caesar. That, that is where our loyalties lie. That is where we have polluted Christianity. And, you know, certainly in the, in the more Trumpy evangelical churches, it gets really overt. And a lot of us would be like, eh. But it is, I would say, covert in most other places where we have these loyalties, where we rely on welfare programs and policies and politicians and, you know, the Federal Reserve and, and their monetary systems and all these things for our protection and our prosperity. We trust these individuals. We look to them for guidance. We want there to be programs that we can relate to, that are quantifiable, that we can depend on. We trust in the arm of flesh. That was another big one that I failed to mention. Um, oh no, I, I did mention it. This idea that it's the work of our hands, right? The arm of flesh, as it says in the Book of Mormon a lot. Rejoicing in the work of our hands. These institutions, we've created them. It's we the people. Right? And, and so we depend upon the arm of flesh rather than depending upon God. And as Isaiah said, we're forsaking God by seeking political and military alliance, support, defense, protection from anyone other than God. So to me then, I think that we are very idolatrous, as Spencer W. Kimmel said, precisely because so few in the church even see this. The Guta has the, the quote where he says, William von Guta, I think that's his full name. He has the quote that um, I'll probably get mostly right. None are more hopelessly, none are more hopelessly enslaved than those that falsely believe that they are free. So I think about that quote. I was like, if we don't understand what our idolatry is, then we have imbibed the traditions of our fathers to such an extent that we think that we are worshiping God in this undiluted gospel that is very contaminated. And we don't realize it because we don't know what we don't know. Our eyes have not been opened. We've not, you know, abandoned these traditions of our fathers. And so we've encumbered Christ's gospel with idolatry. We've created this syncretic religion just like the people of Israel did, absorbing the practices and beliefs of the surrounding cultures to appease and accommodate, to be like them, to be liked, to have a good image. And we justify it all along the way. We still think that we're God's people. We still think that we are worshiping God and, and that we have this gospel or whatever. But hey, it's okay to do this and it's okay to believe that and it's okay to alter it this way. And it's okay that on Monday through Saturday, I do these things, but then on Sunday, I'll come and worship God. And so that to me is the problem that we face. That to me is how we are as much, maybe more idolatrous than the children of Israel were. And so we read the scriptures like the Babylon Bee guy and we think how silly and how stupid the children of Israel, but we don't take into account our own idolatry. We don't realize that just like they had to look at the serpent to live, you know, we have to look to Christ to live. Just as they had, you know, golden calves and idols, we have more sinister and subtle and spiritual idolatry that plagues us. And the worst thing about it is when we think that we're doing the right thing, when we falsely believe that we have, uh, uh, you know, the right gospel, the pure gospel, Right, but we don't understand that we've contaminated it because we've grown up in that culture. And the traditions of our fathers have come up with all kinds of justifications and excuses why it is okay to support Caesar and participate and you know be pro military and pro war and you know go fight here and oh yeah, SEAL team six there and kill that bad guy there and you know protect us here and weapons of mass destruction and nine eleven and the TSA and the police and you know, government welfare programs and social safety nets and all these things to provide us protection and prosperity that we justify again and again and again, yet are inconsistent with a trust and reliance on God.
because we can't serve two masters. And yet I think so many of us try to justify keeping that summer cottage in Babylon while still serving Christ. But God is very clear about this, that he's, he's polar about it. You're either with me or you're not, right? In the Revelation, I would that you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew thee out of my mouth, right? Pick a side. In Second Nephi talking about how there's the church of Christ, right? And then the church of the devil. And anyone who is not in the church of Christ is in the church of the devil. They may be well-meaning. They may think that they're in the church of Christ. That's the mind-blowing aspect of this, right? They may think that their membership is in the church of Christ. And yet for these various reasons, they actually are a card-carrying member of the church of the devil and they don't even realize it. And that is the magic of the church of the devil is to make you think that you're not actually a member. So the church of the devil, and I'll probably maybe do a whole separate Sunday musing about this idea, but it's this expansive concept that if you are not squarely in the church of Christ, following this, this undiluted unpolluted gospel, then in varying aspects, you are not a member of that church, that you are in the church of the devil. And so Christ is very polar in that way, right? And and so we can't contaminate the gospel because to the extent that we do, right, we're not loving and worshiping God. And and I, I suppose we're not at fault for things that we don't know, right? If we If we have not yet realized, right, there are many who you know, have not found the truth because it has not been taught to them. But I think those of us who have the gospel, to whom much is given, much is required. And if we think those of us who have the scriptures, again, like over and over, the, the, the fathers and the prophets in the Book of Mormon are saying, remember, remember, remember. Other than Jesus, that is like the, the most commonly used word from what I recall in the Book of Mormon is remember. And it's not just to remember to be able to like impress people with your knowledge about what happened to the children of Israel and this and that. It's not superficial remembrance. It is remembrance in order to apply it to your life, right? Learning from the past so as not to repeat its mistakes. So in the Book of Mormon, they're saying, remember these things, remember, remember. And what are we to remember? It's God's dealings with the children of Israel, his high standards, his commandments to, you know, abandon idolatry, to come out of Babylon, to be pure, right? To to get rid of these traditions of your fathers. And, And if we're not listening, then we're not following, and, and so that I think is the biggest struggle is so many people in our church, you know, we feel like we're doing great and we're going to church on Sunday and we're reading our scriptures and, you know, doing a ministering visit and checking the box and going to the temple and all the things that, that we're taught to do. And yet in our hearts, if our loyalties are in any way connected to Caesar, to the chief counterfeit on this earth, supported by Satan, then... Our loyalties are not with God. We are trying to serve two masters. We are, we are contaminating the gospel with this belief that we can rely on and seek protection and prosperity from any source other than God. That we're trusting in the arm of flesh and these mortal programs and policies and institutions and all these things when we need to be trusting only in God. And it is polar and it is one or the other. And so... You know, for a real mind-bending thing, I'll tell you how I think about this on a daily basis with the industry that I work in, but topic for another day. Point is that those of us who have the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have the restored gospel, the Book of Mormon, all these things, I think we have higher expectations. And, and, you know, we're still under condemnation because we've treated these things lightly. We've talked about that before, right? That, that we remain under condemnation. Here's Spencer W. Kimball saying, we are an idolatrous people. We've been given these things and we've not been given more. And I think the prophet's mouths have been shut and all these things because we have treated lightly all of these things. We are not doing what we ought. We are, as the Bible says, whoring after other gods. And I think that word is intentional because again, idolatry is often compared to adultery. We're whoring ourselves out. And, and God doesn't want that. And so we need, I think, those of us who have the gospel to be extra emphatic about analyzing our beliefs and our actions to say, do I have a summer cottage, cottage in Babylon? Do I rely on Caesar? Do I feel in my heart that my protection or prosperity in any way comes from man-made things that have been built with our hands, right? Do I have an eye single to God's glory or... 
am I living on the dole or dependent on these social safety nets or, you know, thinking that the military is this great benevolent thing uh, and that, you know, our safety as a people comes from having a strong, you know, military or police or whatever, right? If, if our trust and, and, and reliance on protection and prosperity comes from anything other than God, then as it says in Isaiah and elsewhere, we have forsaken God. God is a jealous God. He doesn't want us to pursue those things anywhere else other than him. So I think there's some radical conclusions that come from this analysis because it changes a whole lot about what you think economically, what you think politically, what you think socially, and the habits and the culture and the practices that we have. I think we need to review with a fine tooth comb because we've grown up in this culture. It's the way things are. It's what we've been used to. It's the traditions of our fathers. And we, we justify all these things while also being Christian or Mormon or following God, yet not realizing how some of them are in deep conflict with one another. And we need to analyze and let go of some of these beliefs and habits and practices that are incongruent with one another. So I think we are idolatrous. I think perhaps in some ways more so, maybe in some ways less, I don't know that it's all or the other thing, but certainly we are idolatrous. And so we can't just read the stories from the children of Israel and dismiss them. If anything, those stories of idolatry are among the most relevant scriptures for us to be reading and pondering in our own day. Why? To remember, to learn from the past so as not to repeat the mistakes of the children of Israel and hopefully get out from under condemnation and qualify ourselves for the additional revelation and scripture and direction that the Lord has promised us, but is conditioned upon our willingness to obey and remember and listen and put into practice the things he's already said. And I think we collectively as a church are doing a horrible job. Our leaders themselves have said this much. And so we got work to do. Enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. We'll see you next week.